Chances are many of you watching this video clicked on the title with some incredulity. You may be thinking, of course science explains things, it explains all sorts of things in the natural world. Some of you may even think science can explain everything about the natural world. This question was explored in a book titled Can Science Explain Everything by philosopher and mathematician John Lennox, which was actually more of a popular level distillation of his book Has Science Buried God, which I read as an undergraduate. However, the question I want to ask is whether science, properly understood, has any explanatory power at all. And I can assure you now that this is not a clickbait title. This is a legitimate question explored in the philosophy of science and, as we will see, by many pioneering scientists. And before we start, I need to thank philosopher of science Steve Meyer, who I'm borrowing this material from when I met him at Cambridge this summer. The first thing we need to do is clarify what we mean by explanation. One definition I found says an explanation is, quote, a statement or account that makes something clear, end quote. Under this definition, it seems like scientific generalizations would fall under this category, but it depends on what we mean by clear, and as a result, this definition is, perhaps ironically, somewhat ambiguous. A more precise definition is posited by Jess Drake in his book Introduction to Logic, which suggests an explanation is a set of statements usually constructed to describe a set of facts that clarifies the causes, context, and consequences of these facts. Thus, for something to qualify as an explanation, to Drake, it must give an account for three things, the cause, the context, and consequences. And as we will see, it's actually this first part, the causal one, which gives us the most trouble. One important thing to point out is that explanations are different from mere descriptions. I can describe the way something happens or will happen without giving a causal account for it. Those of you familiar with statistics know we do this all the time. I can describe the number of heads I can expect to see by flipping a coin 50 times, but the statistical description does not give me a causal account of why the coin is flipped in the first place. Similarly, scientific laws, which are usually written in mathematical form, are very precise at describing the natural world, but we need to do more work to say this really qualifies as an explanation properly understood, and certainly a causal one at that. When it comes to science, we can define the word science as a discipline that builds and organizes knowledge in the form of testable hypotheses and predictions about the world. These predictions may hypothesize causal factors, but the hypothesis itself is not necessarily a cause. Consider the case of Newtonian gravity. Now, I realize this Newtonian picture of gravity has generally been replaced by newer theories, including general relativity and quantum gravity, but as you will see, the same fundamental problem is still with us. I choose Newtonian gravity as an example because Newton himself was faced with these difficulties and even wrote about them. Now, when Isaac Newton wrote the legendary Principia, he was attempting to refute René Descartes and his view of vortices, which said the universe is filled with particles swirling around causing planetary motion. And Descartes himself was part of a school called mechanical philosophy, a term used by Robert Boyle, one of the pioneers of the modern scientific method and who we will come back to later. The mechanical philosophers thought the regular workings of nature could be explained by interactions between matter, sort of like parts of a clock. Now, all these guys, including Newton and Leibniz, who we'll come to in a minute, were devout Christians. They saw the universe as designed by God to run in accordance with regular laws, like a clockmaker designs a clock to run without them really needing to interfere and move the dials by hand all the time. This was significant because it marked a departure from an explanation of the universe in terms of what are called substantial forms. The form theory, heavily influenced by Aristotle, claimed food nourishes because it has a nutritive virtue, and opium makes people tired because it has a dormative virtue, and so on. To the mechanical philosophers, appeals to these substantial forms explain nothing. Now, at this point, I should mention that the Christian tradition has already emphasized the importance of performing experiments for centuries before, thanks to guys like Albertus Magnus, who coined the term experiment, and his student Thomas Aquinas, both saints in the Catholic tradition and competent theologians and philosophers to boot. This mechanistic theory was simply another step in the empirical direction. So anyway, coming back to Newton, he proposed his theory of gravitation that needed none of the matter that Descartes' theory of vortices did. Newtonian gravity acts instantaneously, at a distance, meaning with no material or mechanical interaction, unobservably, universally, meaning all matter gravitates, and in accordance with a precise mathematical formula that you've probably seen before. F equals the gravitational constant times the product of the two masses divided by the distance between them. The problem here is unlike Descartes' theory, Newton's theory requires no matter to do the transmission. It's almost like magic, if you will. And this was pointed out by many of Newton's corresponders. For instance, Leibniz objected to Newton's theory, saying that Robert Boyle, quote, would have never allowed such a chimerical notion. Why is this? Well, gravitation 
acts at a distance with no material or mechanical interaction, it's unobservable, and the cause of gravity is either unintelligible or miraculous. This was a problem because it seemed like Newton was proposing some sort of occult thing. In fact, the term quote, occult power was often used by critics of Newton's theory, claiming his theory did not provide an explanation at all. For instance, Bishop Richard Bentley, in a letter to Newton, questioned his theory of gravitation by saying, quote, "'Tis unconceivable, unconceivable, not inconceivable, so he wrote, that inanimate brute matter should, without a divine impression, operate upon and affect other matter without mutual contact. So how did Newton respond to this? Well, in a letter responding to Bishop Bentley, he basically acknowledges this point. He kind of says, yeah, "'Tis unconceivable that inanimate brute matter should operate upon and affect other matter without mutual contact. And this is one reason why I desired you would not ascribe innate gravity to me. That gravity should be innate, inherent, and essential to matter is to me so great an absurdity that I believe no man who has in philosophical matters any competent faculty of thinking can ever fall into it. So what does he conclude? In the next sentence, he writes, quote, gravity must be caused by an agent acting constantly according to certain laws, but whether this agent be material or immaterial is a question I have left to the consideration of my readers. And in the general scolium to the Principia, Newton famously wrote, quote, hypothesis non fingo, which is roughly translated as I'm not even going to pretend to explain it. In other words, concerning the cause of gravity, Newton literally dodges the question. Now, to Newton himself, it was very clear who this agent is and what the cause is. In the general scolium as well, he writes, quote, in him, in God, all things are contained and moved, kind of citing Colossians 1 and Hebrews. The point here is that Newton relied on mathematics and empirical observations to derive his theory, rather than requiring a causal account a priori. His dodging of the question, if you will, marked a significant change from previous scholars, leading to a distinction between science and philosophy of science that still exists to this day. Scientists generally describe, and philosophers are generally the ones who attempt to explain. Now, personally, I think Newton did a great thing. He was able to give an accurate mathematical description of gravity without needing to provide an explanation for it. If he had waited to publish his theory until he had an explanation, well, he probably never would have published it because to this day, we still do not know what causes gravity. And this also goes for the rest of our fundamental laws and theories in science as well. It's great that some of us can focus on description or prediction without needing to also specify causality, because this allows us to find the most accurate predictions divorced from the sort of explanatory causal piece of it. The problem here is that this distinction is often missed by many of Newton's contemporaries, who endlessly confuse descriptions and explanations. For instance, in my academic career, I am more of an empirical researcher than a philosopher, and I'll admit it's really incredibly embarrassing to hear scientists make this mistake because it makes us look ignorant and unreflective. First of all, scientific laws do not really cause anything, and to say they do commits a category mistake. Rather, scientific laws are descriptions of observations in the language of mathematics. And even the great physicist Stephen Hawking made this error. In The Grand Design, which by the title sounds vaguely theistic, he writes, quote, Because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing, which in one sentence commits a category mistake and either equivocates the word nothing or expresses a self-contradiction. While on one hand, perhaps we should go easy on Hawking because he's not a philosopher, on the other hand, he is making philosophical claims and statements. Now, if you believe in God, you can argue God's will is that the universe generally behaves in accordance with fixed logical rules, which are mathematically intelligible. In this case, God is the efficient cause of all phenomena. But if you're a naturalist or atheist, you need some other explanation for how scientific descriptions turn into causes, or you can simply avoid the question and say there is no explanation. Though I'll add if one wants to take the second route, it would be incredibly ironic to claim theists are irrational or don't look for explanations in a God of the gaps type fashion when it is the naturalist in this case who has a whole list of things they dodge explanations for. Now, I don't mean to be too harsh on the naturalist here. As Wittgenstein famously said, all explanations come to an end somewhere. I just have difficulty understanding why we would stop the explanation before we have a concrete link between the accuracy of scientific descriptions and causality, which theism provides. I mean, to me, naturalism is like the ultimate blue balls. I mean, you're so close, you just need to kick it in the goal. The idea that scientific theories are true is a stance called scientific realism. And perhaps the most famous argument in favor of scientific realism is Hilary Putnam's No Miracles argument, which basically says the success of science is only explainable if the best scientific theories are true. But hopefully by now you can see that we need to clarify what we mean by true. Scientific theories are deemed accurate based on how close they can predict or describe the phenomena in question. Perhaps precise models are selected for based on their accuracy, similar to how those best adapted to their environment survive, so perhaps it is no surprise that the best models succeed on the very task they are selected for. 
But there is something to be said about Putnam's argument. It'd be quite the coincidence, indeed, if scientific descriptions were completely divorced from explanations, even if descriptions and explanations are not necessarily the same thing. So let's see if we can wrap this up in a cohesive way. Our description of scientific laws do not necessarily have any causal power, nor do all successful descriptions have explanatory power. In this case, science properly understood does not necessarily explain anything. However, scientific testing can help us differentiate which causal theory has the most predictive power. In this case, explanations are informed by the results of scientific experiments, but in the end are products of the intelligence of the researcher in question. Causal explanations are interpretations of observations on the part of the researcher or scientist, and often involve the scientist stepping out of doing science and into doing philosophy. This is in part because, as David Hume famously pointed out, we do not observe causality directly. We infer it on the basis of observations of different states of affairs. As a result, scientific observations and theories are invaluable to explaining things, but they won't give us a full explanation as defined by cause, context, and consequences without further thought and reflection. And of course, this further thought and reflection is the role of philosophers and, perhaps dare I say, theologians. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.